All right, guys. So this is 6.2 notes. It is in the red packet titled Unit 6 Congruent Triangles. This is page 7. Okay, today's learning target is I can prove triangles are congruent using we're going to be using three different things, something called SSS, SAS, and HL. They're both, they're all three acronyms that I'm sure you'll understand here in a little bit, okay? So if you remember last time we talked about congruent polygons, there's two requirements. The angles must be congruent and the sides must be congruent, okay? We had to check all of them. Well, that took a long time. Specifically with triangles, there's actually some shortcuts we can use. We're going to talk about three of them this lesson, and then the next time we're going to talk about the other two shortcuts. Okay? The first one is called SSS. This stands for side, side, side. So basically what this means is triangles can be proved to be congruent to each other when all of the sides of one triangle are congruent to all of the sides of a second triangle. So for instance, if I have two triangles right here, and if I told you that this side and this side were congruent, if I also told you this side and this side were congruent, remember these are tick marks. Uh, if you have the same number of tick marks, they are the same measure. And this side and this side. Okay, that would mean that this triangle is congruent to this triangle based on side, that's one side, side, that's another side, side, that's a third side. Okay, SSS. So we're going to spend some time today doing proofs. And on these examples, examples one and two, we're going to be using side, side, side. Okay, so let's take a look at what we know. We're trying to prove that triangle ABC is congruent to XZY. Okay, well, it in our picture, we already have a bunch of tick marks, right? So we already know that AB, or let me back up for a second. In a proof, uh, your first reasons are always going to be what is given to you in the picture. Sometimes they're going to give you something, they're going to clue you into something based on how the picture is labeled. Sometimes they're going to actually give it to you in the problem. Okay, Here it doesn't give us anything in the problem, but according to our picture, different sides are congruent. So like for instance, we know that AB and X z are congruent so we're going to say that as our given that was just it's told to us in the in the chart we need to fill in the blanks okay what's another set of sides that are congruent to each other well this one has two tick marks this one has two tick marks those look like they would be congruent to each other so bc would be congruent to uh, zy okay then the last one this one has three tick marks. This one has three tick marks. Those would be congruent. So AC would be congruent to XY. Okay. Not too shabby. Okay. Why are these two triangles congruent, therefore? Our reason is going to be SSS. So if you forget, you may be off to the side. Remind yourself, okay, what did this just prove? This just proved that this was a side, this was a side, this was a side. So that's your reason, side, side, side. Okay, because all three sides are congruent, then the triangles are congruent. Let's try example two. Example two, we know that JML, we're trying to prove is congruent to LKJ. So in this picture, it's a little bit funky, right? These triangles are actually squashed up next to each other. This is its own triangle, and this is its own triangle. Okay, what do we know based on our picture? Well, we have some tick marks right here. It looks like JK, JK is going to be congruent to ML. Okay, interesting. So JK is congruent to LM. That's given. Okay, what's another thing that's given in our picture? What's another thing that's given in our picture? We have two tick marks right here on both sides. So that means that this side and this side would be congruent as well, right? JM would be congruent to KL. Mm -hmm. okay. JM would be congruent to KL. Now, is there anything else given on our picture? We have a side. We have a side. 
Nothing else is given. Okay, so I'm about to introduce something to you that you probably have never seen before. This third side, okay, if you look here, um, if I cover up this JKL triangle, hopefully you see that that green side is the third side of that triangle, right? But then if I cover up this triangle, that green side is also the same third side on that triangle. So this green side is actually a part of both triangles, okay? Anytime this happens with a side, we can say that JL, that's the name of this side, would be congruent to itself, okay? Um, if it helps as well, let me draw this out off to the side. Okay, those are my two separate triangles. This is the one side of that triangle. This is the other side of the chat triangle. They're the same measure, okay, but there's actually two separate triangles. This is called the reflexive property. If you think about uh, when you um, look at a mirror, you're looking at your reflection, so it kind of mirrors itself. Uh, if you see here, those lines are mirroring each other, so that's how you can remember it, reflexive property. Okay, why are these two triangles then congruent? It's because of side, side, side. Okay, same reason as before. So this last reason is always going to be one of these acronyms, like SSS, SAS, HL, or the two others we're going to learn next time. Okay. Let's take a look at page 8. This is our second shortcut. SAS congruence. Okay, this one stands for side angle side. So maybe next to this, right, side angle side. So this one's a little bit different. We need, in order to prove that two triangles are congruent, we need to prove that two sides are congruent and the included angle. We're going to talk about what that means. Of one triangle are congruent to two sides and the included angle of a second triangle. Okay. So, for instance, if I told you that this side and this side were congruent to each other, that's a side, so that's one side, that's our first S, right? And then if I gave you another side, what if I said this side and this side were congruent to each other? That's another S, but we need an angle. Okay, this is very important, so listen up real closely. What I mean by the included angle is the angle where the two sides meet each other. Okay, so this tick mark right here is going all the way to C. This tick mark right here is going all the way to C. These two sides meet at angle C. This is the angle that must be congruent. Okay, so similarly up here, these two sides meet at angle D. Those are the two sides that must be included, okay? It would not work if E or F were the angles I was talking about. It would not work if A or B were the angles I was talking about. It has to create SAS. The angle has to be in between the sides. So let me show you. SAS, right? SAS. Okay, the angle has to be where they meet. It's very important. All right, or it's not a thing. Example three, okay? This one, we're finally introducing kind of what I was talking about earlier. Remember, sometimes it gives you information based on the picture, like it gives you tick marks and stuff. Sometimes it gives you information in the actual problem, okay? So take a look here. It says C is the midpoint of AD. That is something that has been given to us. So in our reasons, our first statement could be that C is the midpoint, I'm just going to abbreviate, of AD. C is the midpoint of AD. Okay, what's the other thing that's given? There's nothing else in the picture, but it also said that C is the midpoint of BE. So we could also write that down. C is the midpoint of BE. So those are the two things that they told us. Interesting. So anytime, guys, it gives us a midpoint, we got to ask ourselves, okay, what does a midpoint mean? Why does that matter? Okay, a midpoint is the middle of a line, the middle of a segment, right? So if C is the midpoint of AD, okay, here's AD, 
C's in the middle. If you didn't know this, anytime it divides a segment in half, that means that this part is going to be congruent to this part. Okay, we can represent that on our picture. So now we can say that AC, right, is going to be congruent to CD. Why do we know that? Well, we would call it something like this. Definition of a midpoint. That's, well, that's the reason definition of midpoint. Okay. Then we're going to ask ourselves, well, what's the other thing we know? C is also the midpoint of BE. So you might see where I'm going with this. This side would also be congruent to this side, right? BC would be congruent to CE. Again, the definition of a midpoint. So pause here for a second. What have we done? We've done a lot of stuff, right? We have two triangles. We're trying to prove that they're congruent. Okay. We know we have a side and we have a side. Okay. Well, what we were talking about was side angle side, right? So we probably need an angle. Okay. If you remember with side angle side, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you this is going to be our reason, side angle side. The angle has to be where the sides meet, right? So we're saying that this angle and this angle have to be congruent. Okay, we couldn't use D and A. We couldn't use B and E. We got to use these two angles. Okay, so angle B, C, A. I got to use three letters because if I only said angle C, you wouldn't know which side of the picture I was talking about. Angle B, C, A would be congruent to E, C, D. Angle ECD. Okay, why is that true? Well, some of you may know the reason there is because they're vertical angles. Okay, they're vertical angles. That's the reason that those are two are congruent to each other. That's the rule there. Okay. All right, so now we know that we have a side. How about I use a different color here? We have a side right here. A side, so that's one side. Then we had an angle, it's one angle, and we had a side. So side, angle, side, that's the reason, okay? Moving on, example four, what has it given us? It has said that GH, this symbol right there, means parallel, okay? It means they go on forever without touching, right? So it's actually represented by this little symbol right here. So we can say that as a given, GH, is parallel to FJ. GH is parallel to FJ. Okay, what else did the picture give us? Well, we have these tick marks. So wouldn't we know that GH right here is parallel to FJ? That's something we would know, right? Excuse me, would be congruent to FJ, right? Yeah, that's something we know. So what's that? That's a side, right? So we're kind of getting some places. What else would we know? What else could we know? This one's kind of tricky, right? you got to kind of come up with some stuff. Well, if you remember from example two, remember example two? That looks like a pretty similar picture, right? If you remember, this side would be congruent to itself. So like for instance here, I'll use the same color so it even stands out. This side would be congruent to itself, right? So we could say GJ on this triangle would be congruent to GJ on the top triangle, right? Congruent to itself. This is called reflexive property. We already talked about that one. So now we have another side. Okay, this is side angle side, right? So we need to figure out another, we need to figure out an angle now, okay? So we're going to have SAS. So what's going to be our other angle? Okay, we need to figure out another angle. Well, you're probably not going to get there on your own, and that's okay. But here we have, um, let, me, let me draw something else out for you. So this might look more familiar. If remember here, if we had two parallel lines, we could have a line going through it. it looks like this. It was called a transversal. You may remember that. So in similar idea, this is parallel lines. So if we extended this line a little bit, 
this would be considered a transversal. Okay, so we could actually say that this angle right here, this angle right here, and this angle right here would be similar to like this angle right here and this angle right here. So back in the day, a couple units ago, what were those kinds of angles called? They were called, they were in the interior and they were on alternate sides of the transversal. So we could call those alternate interior angles, right? We talked about that a few units ago. Okay, so let's write it. HGJ, angle HGJ could be congruent to angle FJG. So guys, as you can see, we have, we have a side, we have an angle, we have a side. We have a side, we have an angle, we have a side. So this is SAS, S-A-S. -S. Cool? All right, good job, guys. We've got one more. One more for this lesson. We have HL congruence. And most, many of you are like, what in the world? That's not an A or an S. So hypotenuse leg is what this one's called. Two right triangles. Okay, if you remember, you've probably seen the word hypotenuse and leg before. Uh, hypotenuses are only in right triangles. So this, this congruency type only works if you have right triangles, which means triangles with right angles, right? So that's a right angle, that's a right angle, okay? So if two right triangles can be proven congruent when the hypotenuse, okay, let's remind ourselves what the hypotenuse is. It is the side that's across from the right angle, okay? So if this guy, that's across from the right angle, that's the hypotenuse, that's the H. If that is congruent to the hypotenuse over here, okay, that's the H. And then and then just another leg, okay? So like, let's say the little leg right here. This, this guy, that's an L, would be congruent to this guy. As long as the hypotenuse uh, is congruent to the other hypotenuse, and one of the legs is congruent to the other leg, then you should be good. So in other words, here's a leg, here's a leg, and then you might want to write hypo, hypo, so you remember, leg, leg, okay? All that it requires is that it must be a right triangle, and then you must have the hypotenuse and the leg be congruent to each other, okay? All right, so let's take a look at an example here. Example five. We have another new, te new term here. This means perpendicular. Okay. If parallel means they never touch, perpendicular means they meet at a right angle. Okay. Kind of like this picture. They meet at a right angle. Make a 90 degree angle. Okay, okay make right angles. So that is what's given, right? So we would just copy that down. AB is perpendicular to DC. Again, guys, I'm on page nine, if I did not mention that. AB is perpendicular to DC. Okay. Well, what else do we know? We don't know anything else with this given, but our picture says some stuff, right? We know that this side right here this side right here and this side are congruent. Why do we know that? Because it told us, right? So we know that AD right here is gonna be congruent to AC. Okay, why do we know that? That is given. Okay, so if we know, so, so let's just keep on going, that's good. And then what would we know based on the definition of what perpendicular means. So let's look. AB is this line. AB is right here. It is perpendicular to DC. DC. If this is perpendicular to DC, what could we say about this angle and this angle? We could say that they are both right angles, right? We could say that angle ABD and angle ABC are right angles, are right angles, right? All right, that's kind of cool. That's, that's helpful, right? Definition of perpendicular. Now, 
how would we prove that triangle DAB and CAB are right triangles? Well, it's it's just it's just what a right triangle is, right? So we could say the definition of a right triangle. The reason we're doing steps three and four is because a part of HL congruence is making sure that they are right triangles. Okay, so we got to make sure that we know that they are right triangles. That's a part of the requirement. Okay, last step. We know the hypotenuse looks like, right, because this is going to be our hypotenuse and this is going to be our hypotenuse, but we got to prove that a leg is congruent. Okay, we've got this triangle and this triangle. Could we prove that DB and BC are congruent to each other? I, I can't personally think of any strategies that we could do there. But look here, AB, it's got this whole reflexive thing going on again, right? So AB could be congruent to itself, AB. We could do two tick marks. That would be reflexive, okay? So what is our reason? Well, this is our L, so we have HL. Guys, almost every time there's a right angle in your picture, you're probably going to do HL. Almost every time. Okay. All right, guys, last example. Example six. DA is uh, congruent to BC. Why do we know that? Our picture told us. So let me highlight this. <coughs> Whew, excuse me. So sorry. DA is congruent to BC. We know that because of our picture. Okay, we also know that D and B are right angles because of our picture. Okay, that's some helpful stuff. Okay, um, if you look here, guys, we have some right triangles again, right? So we could actually say that DA and BC, don't those look like legs of the triangle? So we've got some legs. That's cool. Uh, it'd be nice to have the hypotenuse, wouldn't it? Well, if you look at this triangle only, that's the hypotenuse. If you look at this triangle only, that's the hypotenuse. Doesn't that have the whole reflexive thing going on? We're probably going to use that. But before we get there, let's answer this. All right angles are congruent. Okay, why would that be significant? And why would that? Why would we need to know that? Okay, we could actually say that angle D is congruent to angle D. Guys, we don't actually need to do step three. So I'm going to kind of cross that out. We don't actually need step three to prove this, what we're doing. But we do need step four. So we need to know that they are right triangles, okay? And we know that because triangle DAC, or sorry, we know that triangle DAC and triangle BCA are right triangles. Okay, we know that. Um, and then we need to figure out our hypotenuse again, right? Remember the the reflexive property. So if we know that AC and AC are equal to each other, right? They're the same thing. That is called reflexive property. Okay, so this would be HL, because we have an L right here, and then the H is, is congruent to itself on both triangles. Okay, so guys, that is our notes. Uh, if you want to watch 6.3 for the last two shortcuts.